Today I have a, a message that I want to share with you. And I got to warn you right up front. It's in a book that admittedly is not what most people would consider to be the most uplifting, positive, affirming book of the Bible. But maybe you're like me, and the closer you've leaned into your relationship with Jesus, this book has changed in view. I remember the very first time I read the book of Ecclesiastes, I thought, boy, God, you really just wanted to get us going here. And then the longer, like I said, I've been walking with Jesus, the more I realize this, there's a lot going on to this book that really can help our lives. There is a lot of positive things that we can pull out of this as we look at the words of Solomon to us. And so we're going to center up around there today. So if it's been a while since you've read that book and maybe takes you a minute to find it in your Bible, you'll want to do, do, just do that because we're going to be all over it today. But we just came out of this holiday that we call uh, Labor Day, and at its inception, it was meant to create a special day for workers to be given some meaningful recognition for the effort that they put towards the success of the American economic engine. But now, after about 140 years, how many of us are just glad to have an extra day off? I know that I am. And how many of us, even on that day, we, we struggle with feeling a sense of that appreciation. We're really just trying to get by every day, making sure that our homes and that our families are well taken care of. I know that's a lot of our perspective. And when it comes to work and, and the efforts and the meaning of life, I think there's perhaps no more qualified book of the Bible that deals with this than the book of Ecclesiastes. So, as I said, we're going to take a look at some key moments of the book of Ecclesiastes. Under this main idea that under the sun, all of our labor and efforts, they add up to this Hebrew word called hevel, which translates to us as vapor or smoke or in some translation, meaninglessness. And life, if we're honest, is full of uncertainty, chance and risk. And even with the most proper use of godly wisdom, but the secret to true life is placed in the heart of every person. And those who fear the Lord find it. That would be essentially a synopsis of the gospel. A little history about the Labor Day celebration was a man by the name of William McCabe. He was a parade marshal in the city of New York. And they had decided to put this practice into motion in 1882, September 5th. And he had been organizing this parade celebration for quite a while. And he invited people from the labor union and, and all kinds of people in the city to help inaugurate this Labor Day celebration parade. And like many well-intentioned celebrations, the day came and there were all of the police and, and all of that lined up. And this was not without controversy. And so there was some apprehension on a lot of people's parts. Even to the point where when several of the groups of people had lined up, and they were about ready to take off. They realized that they had no music to march to. And people from the crowd began to naysay and, and really lack faith and belief that this was a good idea. Tried to talk him out of it when suddenly a man named Matthew McGuire, who was part of the labor union, came running over to Mr. McCabe and he said, hey, um, I don't know if you're aware, but there is a band that just came across on the ferry and they have a band and more or less asking for permission if they could come and play 
Of course, he said yes. And it was upon that moment that they lined up with the marchers and began to march through Lower Manhattan. Historians tell us that by the end of the parade, there was anywhere between 10 and 20,000 people that decided to join in this celebration, and it went long into the night. And they did many of the things that some folks still do on Labor Day. And I just want to say that as I think about the fact that by the end of the 19th century, there was a lot of turmoil in our country, even though we were trying to get some things right. And so, how do we celebrate Labor Day? Well, we hit a sale on overstocked lawn furniture and mattresses. And, and we bring an end to hot dog eating season, which spans from Memorial Day to Labor Day, where Americans gorge themselves on roughly 818 hot dogs every second. And every one of you is going, I don't even eat hot dogs. Well, somebody's eating them. Our summer barbecues, they fade into foliage, walks, and pumpkin spice everything. And despite the fact that most pumpkin spice products have literally zero pumpkin in them, we know that coffee peddlers stand to make millions over these next few months. I think one of my favorite anticipations when it comes to unhealthy food is the pumpkin spice blizzard at Dairy Queen. I mean, I don't know how they got something to taste so amazing, but I'm with it. This day, it also marks the approaching time and season that many of us call our very favorite, the fall season. A time where many of us may find a place of reflection and contemplation as the weather cools and landscape creates a moment of colorful collages where there's no filters needed. We're encouraged through our imagination to take some personal inventory. And today, as I said, I want to share with you from this thought right here. You might have grabbed a set of notes when you first got in here, and I hope that you use them. I think writing things down helps them in our minds to remember. But contentment today brings strength for tomorrow. Contentment today brings strength for tomorrow. Let me start by giving a short backstory of the book of Ecclesiastes. You see, in many ways, as I said, it's, it's really misunderstood. It's considered to be a rather depressing book of the Bible. And given the way that it starts off, it does really give that impression. It's written by, or in a pretty uh, prosperous time in Israel, written by King Solomon in the style of a monologue. As you know, when it comes to reading and studying and understanding how the Spirit's trying to speak to you through the Word of God, it's important that we know how he meant for the writer to put it to us. And so the fact that it's a monologue is important. The purpose of this book is to reflect on the meaning and enjoyment of life. Solomon starts off by introducing himself as the teacher the son of David, a king in Jerusalem. And it's important to understanding this book and what it means to have the reader understand that what is being said comes from a, all these different points of view. And it's a discourse meant to cause the reader to draw a particular conclusion. He's not simply qualifying himself as the author. He's speaking as a teacher to a group of people. He's speaking as a son of David, we know as one of those prominent kings in Israel, even to this date, and he's speaking as an author and a king ruling the people of God during a very prosperous time. And so this is how he starts out. And I'm going to be reading from the message translation when it comes to these first parts, because I think it helps us to really grab a hold of just in our modern thinking, the words here. And he starts out and he says, these are the words of the quester, David's son and king in Jerusalem. And he says, smoke, nothing but smoke. There's nothing to, nothing to anything and it's all smoke. It's uplifting, right? What's there to show for a lifetime of work, a lifetime of working your fingers to the bone? 
One generation goes its way and the next one arrives, but nothing changes. It's business as usual for old planet Earth. The sun comes up and the sun goes down and then again and again, the same old round. The wind blows south, the wind blows north, around and around and around it blows. Blowing this way, then that, the whirling erratic wind. All the rivers flow into the sea, but the sea never fills up. The rivers keep flowing to the same old place and then start all over and do it again. Everything's boring. Sounds like kids and youth. Utterly boring. No one can find any meaning in it. Boring to the eye, boring to the ear. What was will be again. What happened will happen again. There's nothing new on this earth. After year after year, it's the same old thing. Does someone call out, hey, this is new. Don't get excited. It's the same old story. Nobody remembers what happened yesterday. And the things that will happen tomorrow. Nobody will remember them either. Don't count on being remembered. All right, let's go home. <laughs> this is not what we want to hear, is it? Don't count on any of the hard work and all the effort and all the sweat and the blood and the tears and the energy you've put into things. Think that it's going to matter one bit. Don't get ahead of yourself. This is a terrible way to start. Like no good author would ever start a book out this way unless he intends for them to just not read anymore. Mankind for the longest time has searched and been preoccupied with creating and searching for newest and the most creative and original things out there. We're motivated to have our life mean something. We're so taken with great people their talents and creativity. We desire to give and to get credit where it's due. And, and then we read these words and we just want to chuck our Bible. And honestly, we've all been frustrated by what seems the hamster wheel of life, the meaninglessness of life. I mean, how many times have you been looking for the solution to what appears like a new problem in your life only to discover through some article or through a friend that the solution was found oftentimes many years ago. In our modern day culture, it's always wonderful when somebody walks up to you and says, you know, there's an app for that. Really? Thanks. While the point of this book is much deeper, it gives us a clue of how to deal with the pain of feeling frustrated, stuck, trapped, overworked, underpaid, underappreciated, unsuccessful. And if we read between the lines of verse 9, it has a treasure that reveals truth. This nothing new, if you really dig into it, coming from perhaps the wisest man who ever lived, is not trying to, in a sense, drag people down. He's trying to give a simple reality. There's nothing new. You're not alone. We're not the only ones with these problems. It's not anecdotal to know that you are not alone in life's issues. It's the truth of what God has provided for every person on planet earth, community, family, friendship, a relationship with himself. You're not alone. Sure. You've got a list of problems. Sure. Life can seem rather blase and meaningless at times, but the most depressing part about it would be if you actually had to go through it alone and you do not. You see, understanding that there's nothing new, it's the wisdom of looking at history, at my history, at your past, at my past, as God's 
story. Ultimately, it's his story to write. And we can either learn from history or as we know, we can repeat it. And believe it or not, with this terrible start to this message and all of the depression and all of the antithetical information that I've spilled out on to you, I've really come to help some folks today. I've come to help myself today. You see, we discover that our past problems, our past issues, our past mistakes, they don't have to just stay as the past problem or the past mistake. They can actually offer help for present pressure. This is what it means to look at history as his story. You see, if we look at life and say, you know what? The truth of God's word says to me that God is working all things out together for the good of them that love him and are called according to his purpose. If I take that to be the gospel truth, then I have to look at the circumstances in my life as what sometimes temporary difficulty that can have positive effect in my present and in my future. Now, we know that some of the issues and stuff that we deal with are somewhat our own choice and fault. That's valid. But even in those things, God is powerful enough, thinking forward enough to know how to turn it for your good. Do you accept that grace? Do you accept that mercy? There's nothing new under the sun. Not even the most creative sinners has ever done anything original. How many have ever been proud about a sin that you've done? You're like, wow, that was like, I mean, you didn't call it sin at the time. You just, maybe it was a scheme. Maybe it was a thing. Nobody's going to raise their hand. I forgot I was in church. <laughs> The simple truth, like I said, it can help us. It may mean letting go of some pride. It may mean that. It may mean asking for some help. Not many of us move forward victoriously in life without asking for some help. I mean, true. At some point, we hit a wall that we can't break down ourselves. And we either wind up crying out to God or crying out to mom. Sometimes both. Speaking of pride, look at what Solomon says. Chapter 1, verse 16 and 18, he says, I said to myself, I know more and I'm wiser than anyone before me in Jerusalem. I've stockpiled wisdom and knowledge. What I've finally concluded is that so-called wisdom and knowledge are mindless and witless. Nothing but spitting into the wind. Hmm. Much learning earns you trouble. The more you know, the more you hurt. If you're a parent here today, you know that's true. You know that old thing that plays in your mind when your kids are doing their thing and you know they're running and you're going, I don't even want to know. The old saying that what well, you don't know won't hurt you, but somehow we still want to know so bad. We're not wise sometimes, are we? It's just better off. And don't doubt, there's many wise people today, but apparently wisdom and knowledge are not the answer to a pain-free and trouble-free existence here on earth. Over several chapters, Solomon reflects on his attempts to capture a more meaningful life and find hope through his observations of the people under his rule. He takes in all the pleasures of this world. He endows himself with privilege, knowledge, and wisdom reserved only for people of his status. Yet some of the brightest spots in the whole book, which frankly are still pretty dim, we find in chapter 3. 
We've heard these poetic words through some billboard chart songs, thank God. However, whatever they lack in inspiration, they make up for in resolve. And I use the word resolve very much on purpose. And you'll find out why. But chapter 3 in Ecclesiastes, it says, For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up. A time to weep, and a time to laugh. A time to mourn, and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek, and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to tear, and a time to sow, a time to keep silent, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. What gain has the worker from his toil? I've seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into the heart of man. Yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. That is God's gift to man. And I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Amen. That's another way that I think we can reduce pain, frustration in our life and in our lot. As the Bible puts it in 12 through 14, he's basically saying there's a time for all of these things. And in knowing that and in understanding that and seeing the wheel of time spin round and round, we're going to have to resolve and stand on a few things. If all that we do, if the effort that we put into things ultimately is hevel or ultimately is smoke, ultimately is vanishing with the wind, then the encouragement is to find things in life that are worth the price. Resolve to be happy today or resolve to be content today. Be grateful for and enjoy the people that are in your life now. I know that's hard. I look at some of the people in my life and I'm like, really, this is what you set me up with, God? Are you kidding me? You laugh because you know it's true. We all have our favorites and we're human and we should or yeah, we should. Enjoy the place that you are now. Enjoy the work that you have now. Even though it's brutal, it may be difficult, it may be feeling pointless. What good will it do you to feel that it's worthless and terrible? It's what you have now. Resolve to serve God now. When you're young, when you're of age, Live on purpose, with a purpose now. Contentment, as we know, it's a mindset. It's not a feeling. If you get past the age of 13, you know. It's not about a feeling. Every kid that's ever walked into ninth grade at high school knows. They no longer look forward to really going to school. The whole reason they're there is to hang out with their friends. Even the most studious student. Because they don't really want to go. They don't feel like going. They feel like hanging out with their friends and being successful. If that can be done, life will be meaningful. And some of them perpetuate it on to university for four and for eight and 12 years. Assuming that they're going to get a great job that will give them a more sense of purpose and meaning. 
Because after all, money is meaning, right? If you all keep smiling at me, I'm going to die laughing. <laughs> Contentment is a direct result of an attitude of gratitude. Some of this come by it a little easier. And it isn't because our circumstances have been better per se. Most of the people that I know that have the greatest amount of gratitude in their life, if you take 10 minutes and talk to them, their story has been littered with tragedies. They have at some point decided it's meaningless unless I decide to put meaning to it. And that meaning is held in my desire and attitude to live contently. I don't have tomorrow necessarily, but I do have today. And I don't have all of the greatest relationships, but I got you. I don't have all of the money in the world, but I have enough to buy a milkshake. Or a pumpkin spice latte. I know that what I'm talking about here today seems like Christianity 101 and just fundamental being a good person. Why are we struggling so hard? Contentment. Somebody's preaching better than I am. <laughs> Contentment is a decision that you make, not a result of your preferred circumstances. I know that we know this, but we're still looking for the right circumstances so that we can show up to church on time with a smile on our face. We're looking for the right situation so that we can show up to our job and actually do it with some integrity. We're actually looking for our kids to obey so that we can have some pride that we have somehow done something right. I'm going to stop there because I don't want to make everybody mad at me. But as we think about our lives, we can be pulled into every direction of what we have and what we don't have, how we feel. And if we aren't careful, we allow our changing circumstances to rule our decisions and control our commitments. How many times have you been let down by a friend when they call you and say, I just, I don't, I don't, I can't. And you know, it's a matter of the way they feel. And we want to give people a break. We want to give ourselves a break. And I get it. Many times we get too busy for our own good. This is all the notion of trying to find happiness. But we're cautioned in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 3. It says too much activity gives you restless dreams. I know. I had the toughest time sleeping last night. Too many words and promises make you a fool. Have you ever double booked yourself? You spend the next 30 minutes trying to figure out how long does it take to get from one place to another? We do it. And just as I mentioned, we... We got to view this book as being written from different points of view. Some believe it's a progression of Solomon's drifting away from God throughout his life. And you can definitely see that in some of the words that he says. But most importantly, there are a few, there are two things that we must understand in order to get the true meaning in the seemingly, in this seemingly depressing book. It's in monologue, like I said, it's encompassing two characters meant to challenge the reader, the teacher with wisdom and knowledge and the author or one giving the final word. Secondly, the use of the word meaninglessness or hevel or smoke, which in its, like I said, original Hebrew means vapor or smoke is used here as an enigma. That's not a superhero. It's a paradox. Smoke appears to be visible like a solid. 
But as you reach out to grab a hold of it, there's nothing there. This paradox is used over 38 times throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. So in short, if you want to know what the book of Ecclesiastes is all about, it's about smoke. All to make the point that the author wants to conclude with at the end. The teacher wrestles with the harsh reality that our life is like smoke or just a vapor. And in the grand march of time, our lives are so temporary and fleeting. And even though we may climb high mountains, enjoy great achievements, the mountain itself takes no notice. Not even one wave of the ocean will halt one second for all of mankind's accomplishments. He rambles on about how he sought meaning and wisdom and wealth and pleasure, justice, but found no certainty, nothing solid of any kind. After all, one day you can be living your best life now. And the next tragedy strikes and can take it all away. If you were living in the housing market in 2008, you know the reality that that was for many people. And we lean on many circumstances in our life and think that they'll never end. They're only going to escalate and grow and get better and better and better. And sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. And if you've built your house on that rock, that foundation, then scripture tells us that in the end, it's meaningless. It's smoke. Even the things that you feel are so real. You reach out to grab them and you find there's nothing there. The author's basic goal is to point out all the ways that we try to find meaning and purpose apart from God and let the teacher deconstruct it. And this happens by pointing out life's great equalizers. Time and death. The thing that every human being is subjected to, regardless of your wealth, knowledge, power, and relationships. No matter who we are, we've got to remember who it is that's writing this book. History tells us that he's perhaps even still one of the richest people to ever live and wisest. It was he that asked God for wisdom and God gave it to him. The Bible tells us more than anyone else. Yes, it gives us a clue, a notion of the types of things we should ask for from God. But yet we see that even in that gift, that was not the promise. Wisdom was not the promise. It was the relationship with God. That was the promise. And it's the same for you and I. There's some Solomon and Solomonettes in this room today. There's some poor and there's some wealthy folks in this room today. There's a lot of wisdom and knowledge in this room today. Yet the two great equalizers that we all must come to understand is you've only got so much time and it ends at some point. And while we can look at that as a depressing truth, we can look at it as a real igniter. You can hear it said this way, that it doesn't matter how young or how old you are. If you're still breathing, God's not done. You may have decided at some point that you're done, but apparently you're not the one in charge. You may think that your life is lived out its purpose, but apparently that's not the case. How do I know? In the most obvious way, you're still here. And you either accept all of God's mercy and all of his grace and his goodness and that he has you still here for a reason and you lean into that or you lean on your own understanding and in all your ways don't acknowledge him and you just walk your own way. 
And in that, what we notice is generally speaking, Christians can become some of the most cantankerous and bitter people on the face of the planet. Because in one side of their brain, they believe that there's a God who's supposed to be so good that they're going to spend eternity with in heaven singing great songs. Yet on the other, they look at this dichotomy and go, but it sucks real bad now. I don't want to live both ways. I don't want to live double-minded. I don't want to be unstable. I realize I'm not in control. But I'm so glad I know the one who is. And he's invited me into his presence. He's invited me into his place. And it's not a groveling that I have to do to be there. It's an invitation that he has practically laid out every possible provision for me to do that. This is the God that we, we have relationship with. This is the one that you've come to find life and meaning with today. I don't know if you realize that when you came in to praise and worship with your brothers and sisters in Christ, but I'm just reminding us. God's good, you guys. No matter who we are, we're still subject to these things. Careers change, wealth comes and goes, pleasures only last for so long, then it's back to reality. Wisdom, while better than seeking pleasure, is not a guarantee to a successful life because it's too subjective. One might even ask this, what's the point? What's the point in living well? It's a common sense question. What's the point in living well? Shouldn't I just do things the way that I want? No, because even that smoke. You want to be a smoker? <laughs> it's okay. I've decided I like me, so you can if you want. <laughs> so what's the way forward? Where's the hope in this? Frustrated, feeling stuck. How do we find life and true enjoyment? How do we live life in the mindset or in the midst of hevel? That was my way of being able to say hell, but I just didn't put it there. The author, he clues us in on the key to life here under the sun. We must learn to accept hevel, to acknowledge that Almost all of life is ultimately out of my control. If you've got some skill and you've got some wealth and you've got some smarts, this is hard for you. The closer you have to nothing, I think this becomes easier. Because it's smacking you in the face every day. That's why we so badly want to live independently. We want to get as far away from that uncomfortable truth that we're not in control as possible. How do I amass as much control as I can over this uncontrollable circumstance? Some of us, we buy stocks. That's a paradox or a dichotomy. You see, about six different times at some of the bleakest moments of this monologue, the teacher talks about the gift of God. The gift of God, which is the enjoyment of life, the simple good things in life, a good meal, friendship, family, a sunny day. Why are these things so important? Because you can't really control these things. And you're not guaranteed them. And that's really their beauty. When I come to adopt a posture of total trust in God, it frees me to simply enjoy my life as I actually experience it. They call it being present. 
Be here now. When you go to lunch this afternoon or you go home and eat lunch or whatever the case may be, practice being there. In this, I enjoy my life actually as I experience it, not as I think it ought to be. Because even my expectations about life ultimately are smoke. So smoke, smoke, smoke. Everything is smoke. And so the words of the teacher, they come to an end. The author chimes in at the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, starting at verse 8. He says, it's all smoke, nothing but smoke. The quester says everything is smoke. And the final word is besides being wise himself, the quester also taught others knowledge. He weighed, examined, and arranged many proverbs. The quester did his best to find the right words and write the plain truth. The words of the wise prod us to live well. They're like nails hammered home, holding life together. They are given by God, the one shepherd. But regarding anything beyond this, dear friend, go easy. There's no end to the publishing of books and the constant study. It wears you out, so you're no good for nothing else. The last and final word is this. Fear God and do what he tells you. And that's it. Eventually, God will bring everything that we do out into the open and judge it according to his. It's a hidden intent, whether it's good or evil. So how do we wrap this up? If I could ask the band to come for us this morning. How do we wrap this up? As the author of Ecclesiastes directs us, we can look at the past and into the future and see God's goodness. We can be grateful in our circumstances, even as we have learned to accept our position, that we lack the ability to have control of all of life, and that life is unpredictable. As we put our hope and our trust in God, We can take confidence in the fact that God's word is final. God's word is life. He's directing us in a work that will not go up in smoke. That's the way. That's the way forward. And I know for many of us, we've come to that place in our life. But I also know that for as many of those that have come to that place in our life, there's those that are still in the paradox. They're still believing in the enigma. They're still trying to stick their finger through that little smoke ring. We blow it out. And I would say that by God's grace, that that's understandable. In many ways, life can feel like a chance up to bat. And we stand there with 
in some cases, a lot of time in the batting cage and a lot of experience and we're waiting for the ball and we know how to time it out just right. And we get that one nice sweet pitch right over across the middle. And we smack that sucker and it hits the green monster. But then some of us get up there and we've been sick all week and we didn't get much time to practice. And this bat's too heavy. And this helmet is choking my ears. And this pitcher, he's hit a couple of guys. And the first one we get zips behind us. And we want so badly to just get a chance to make a good play. And some of us have been doing that for 15, 20, 30, 40 years. And thank God that by some measure you're here today and you still keep showing up. You still keep showing up. You still hoping for a good pitch. God bless you. I'm gonna have you stand with me. The saints, if you would, I wanna begin to ask you to pray. I believe that the word of God doesn't return void. And we've spent a fair amount of time looking at it today. And maybe we looked at it from a different perspective. There's a lot of different ways to preach about the words of Ecclesiastes. But I just want to ask a question today for all of us. Is there any one thing that you're still leaning into that God's already told you that's not the meaning? And if I could have a couple come be willing to pray for those Pastor Kevin, any deacons or anything that are available, please. This is important. People need freedom in their life. Todd, can I have you come pray, please? Thank you. Can we just believe for people today? That there be freedom in their life. None of us escape this feeling and emotion that the difficulties of life give us. None of us. And we need the hope of Christ to rule and reign in our hearts, not just one time, but for all time. So the worship team's just going to lead us, but I, I, I want you to just trust God. That he wants to bring healing and he wants to bring that sense of purpose and meaning back into your life. And that ultimately it's just all about our relationship with him. And in that there's so much purpose and there's so much meaning. Amen.